Last week, I put together a very awesome little dual nano build in the Thermaltake Core V21 Micro ATX chassis, which was by far the most affordable component used. All up, the build came in at around 2600 US dollars or just shy of 4000 Australian dollars. Naturally, for that kind of money, one would expect a seriously powerful gaming rig, and well, that's exactly what we got. With the Core i7-6700K at its heart, there's more than enough processing power for any and all modern games, especially the 4.5GHz overclock apply for good measure. The 32GB of Kingston memory is without question a little overkill at the moment, but having recently discovered that Ashes of the Singularity's explicit multi-GPU support calls for at least 16GB of RAM, I decided to build a little headroom into this rig. A few of you asked why I stacked both the nano cards together in the build. After all, the Gigabyte z 170 m MX Gaming 5 does offer three full-length PCIe x16 slots, so I could have spaced them apart. Initially, this was my intention, but after realizing that the third PCIe slot is hardwired for x4 bandwidth, I decided to go with the x8 slot. Still, I'll test both configurations to see what impact, if any, this has on frame rate performance. I'll also report on the graphics card temperatures as well as the system power consumption. Having been hugely excited to begin testing the nano build, I couldn't help but be a little disappointed with the current state of AMD's Crossfire. Right now, I'm enjoying playing Tom Clancy's The Division when I get a bit of spare time and I couldn't wait to try out the game at 4K with playable frame rates. Sadly, this never happened due to the lack of proper Crossfire support for the game. Although I was able to load the game with Crossfire enabled and even have both cards rendering, there were serious graphical glitches, in particular extreme flickering. That sucked, so I moved on to the new Hitman title, which I'm still in the process of properly benchmarking. Despite being an AMD supported title, Crossfire didn't appear to be working. When I tried to launch the game in DirectX 12 mode with Crossfire enabled, the game would instantly crash the desktop. Rejecting the thought that Crossfire didn't work in a title that AMD has been so heavily promoting, I did a little searching around, and all I found were countless other Crossfire gamers suffering from the same symptoms, even with the latest 16.4.1 hotfix driver. Other games that I planned to test with using the Crossfire enabled dual nanos that failed to work correctly or at all included Just Cause 3, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, and Rainbow Six Siege. The recently released Quantum Break also lacks Crossfire support, but given how new this title is, I'm happy enough to look the other way on this one. Still, that's a disappointing list of relatively new AAA titles that won't work with Crossfire. Thankfully, I was able to test with Star Wars Battlefront, Call of Duty Black Ops 3, Far Cry Primal, Fallout 4, Grand Theft Auto 5, and Rise of the Tomb Raider, though the DirectX 12 version of Tomb Raider crashed just as Hitman did. I've also tested with The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt and Dying Light, though I wasn't pleased with how either of these games looked as both suffered from slight flickering. Now I realise we aren't getting off on the most positive notes here, but I did say I couldn't help but be a little disappointed. Still, it's not all bad, and when Crossfire was being utilised, the resulting performance was very impressive, as you're about to see. Battlefield 4 might not be the latest and greatest AAA title, but it's still very visually impressive. Due to not only its age, but also lasting popularity, the game's very well supported by AMD and Nvidia, so you can expect their multi-GPU technologies to work flawlessly. Playing at 4K with the lowest possible in-game anti-aliasing level set, a single nano was good for just 31 FPS on average, though it did dip down to 25 FPS at times. Adding a second nano boosted performance to an impressive 59 FPS, 90% greater than the single card performance. The minimum frame rate was also boosted by 92% as frame rates never went below 48 FPS. When compared to the previous generation's dual GPU monster, which is comparable to a pair of 390X graphics cards, the nanos were 16% faster. They were also 51% faster than the GTX 980 Ti. Those wanting to game at 4K with The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt without having to disable rendering features such as hairworks will require some serious GPU power. The single nano setup couldn't even break a 30 FPS average, while the GTX 980 Ti was good for just 34 frames per second. Adding a second nano boosted the average frame rate to 54 FPS for an 86% increase in performance. With frames dipping no lower than 44 FPS, the game was very playable. Unfortunately, there were at times noticeable texture flickering, and despite a lot of effort, I wasn't able to fix this problem. Call of Duty Black Ops 3 plays surprisingly well at 4K using a single nano, and its average frame rate of 43 FPS might not be ideal, but it is still somewhat playable. Having said that, these fast-paced first-person shooters aren't usually games you want to play with sub-60 FPS frame rates, and this is where the second nano really pays off. The 86% performance boost meant an average of 80 FPS, while the worst case scenario only saw the frame rate dip just below 60 FPS. Far Cry Primal is another first person shooter you don't want to be playing at 30 FPS, so a single nano or even GTX 980 Ti won't cut it at 4K. Slotting in the second nano increased performance by 81% to a much more enjoyable 58 FPS. 
Good luck hitting your target with a long range blaster at 30 FPS with frame dips even lower. Once again we find that 4K gamers wanting to enjoy another modern AAA title in all of its glory are going to require more than one current generation GPU. Here we see that the second Nano was able to boost the average frame rate by 74% to a much more desirable 59 FPS. It appears as though V-Sync is enabled given how closely the Nanos performed to the R9 295X2, but I can assure you it wasn't. Crossfire didn't scale particularly well in Fallout 4, which I have to admit I wasn't at all surprised about given this game's insane CPU requirements. Still, there was an extra 64% more performance to be had when running a second nano card, and with an average of 59 FPS, the game ran very nicely. Unfortunately, I was only able to get the nanos working in Crossfire using DirectX 11 mode for Rise of the Tomb Raider. The game wouldn't even load with DirectX 12 enabled, so there's some work to be done here for sure. Still, this isn't a true DirectX 12 title anyway, so not a big deal. Running with DirectX 11, the dual nanos were 81% faster than a single car with an average frame rate of 56 FPS. This made the duo 17% faster than the R9 295X2 and 51% faster than the GTX 980 Ti. F1 2015 wasn't exactly the most visually impressive or demanding title to be released last year. But even so, at 4K it does require quite a bit of GPU power to get the job done. Like many of the first person shooters, this race simulator ideally requires 60 FPS or more for smooth and enjoyable gameplay. For that, a second nano was really required and although it only boosted performance by 63%, that was enough for an 80 FPS average. Like Battlefield 4, we find another well developed game in Grand Theft Auto 5. In fact, even more so really. The nanos certainly agree as we see an awesome 97% improvement in performance when adding a second card. That's some seriously impressive scaling right there. The game looks great at 4K and plays exceptionally well in the dual nanos. Unfortunately, although Crossfire does scale very well in Dying Light, the game suffers from the same slight flickering that we found in The Witcher 3, which is pretty disappointing. Performance wise, the dual nanos were 93% faster than a single car for an average of 52 FPS. Finally, we have Ashes of the Singularity, which was included as this was the only DirectX 12 title that worked with Crossfire. This game does support multi-GPU cards, though you wouldn't know it looking at the R9 295 X2. The dual nanos were able to slightly improve performance, though I suspect the CPU intensive sections of the benchmarks have shaped the results somewhat. Here are the results comparing the nanos running in an 8 lane configuration alongside an 8 and 4 lane configuration. As you can see, spacing the cards apart to allow for better airflow comes at a performance penalty as the minimum frame rate was reduced by 12% down to 43 FPS, which was actually slower than the R9 295X2. This time, when testing the PCI Express configurations, we see that the 8 lane cards never dip below 44 FPS while the 8 lane and 4 lane configuration dipped to 41 FPS for a 7% reduction in performance. Before wrapping this up, I should give you guys the full disclaimer. This video is merely a follow up to the Dual Nano Gaming Beast build from last week. I just wanted to show you guys how the build performed. This was in no way an AMD versus Nvidia comparison or anything along those lines and I've already made several of those comparisons where I went far more in depth. The GTX 980 Ti was included purely for comparison's sake and unfortunately I didn't have a second on hand for SLI testing. Likewise, I only own a single GTX 980 right now. In the past, I've looked at Fury X Crossfire versus GTX 980 Ti SLI performance so if you're interested, that'd be worth checking out. On a similar note, I'd like to point out that I didn't show frame time performance for the reasons just mentioned. What I did look into beyond the benchmarks you've just seen are the operating temperatures of the nano cards as well as the total system power consumption. As mentioned previously, I had to stack the nanos hard up against each other in this build in order to maximise the available bandwidth to the GPUs. This configuration meant that the primary card's airflow was blocked by the secondary card resulting in low temperatures of 84 degrees on the first card and 77 degrees on the second. Spacing the cards apart meant placing the second card in a slot only wired for times 4 bandwidth, although doing so meant both cards now only operated at up to 76 degrees. In either configuration, we never observed the total system draw from the wall exceeding 500 watts, which is why the Thermaltake Smart DPS G750 watt power supply was used, as this provides sufficient headroom. For example, the maximum power draw when playing Call of Duty Black Ops 3 never exceeded 475 watts. Other games such as Grand Theft Auto 5 reached 490 watts, but never exceeded 500 watts. Overall, I really enjoyed creating this build, and gaming with it this past week has been a blast for the most part. It was unfortunate that so many games didn't work correctly or at all with Crossfire, but when AMD's multi-GPU technology was being fully utilised, the results of 4K were impressive. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Hardware Unboxed, I'm your host Matt as always. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you guys next time.